Thank you, Don, and thank you to all of you. I, I listened to this morning's presentations and discussions and came away feeling humbled and moved. Um, it was extraordinary to, to hear how thoughtful everyone is, is about these challenges that are facing us and the depth of commitment to students and student learning that everyone brings to the, the questions. I hope that, that uh, Professor Tinson and I can add a little to that discussion, but my suspicion is that the experience and um, knowledge in the room vastly outweighs what's on the stage. So we'll try to be provocative and personal and give you some of our own experience. The way we're going to uh, conduct ourselves this afternoon is uh, to have a conversation. We've developed a set of questions that we're going to ask one another, and we'll just kind of let it roll talking about these issues. That means that you're just going to be sitting in on the latest episode in a conversation that's really been going on uh, since last summer, uh, when Professor Tinson and I sat down in my office and started talking about what are we going to do on the campus this year, and how do we assure that we both are listening to and empowering our students, and that we're maintaining a community of learning. Hmm. Um, I want to give you just a little bit of background on Hampshire and a little bit of background on, on myself. Um, Hampshire is a relatively young school. Uh, we were really founded by the other four colleges in the five college consortium as an experiment in disrupting higher education. I heard the word disruption come up in the discussions this morning, and it's, it's a foundational word uh, for us. Um, our approach is designed to challenge traditional approaches to higher education. The school's mission is to foster a lifelong passion for learning, inquiry, and ethical citizenship that inspires students to contribute to knowledge, justice, and positive change in the world. So. We're right there on a commitment to social change explicitly up front. And by so doing, to transform higher education. So that's the disruption part. Um, the vision of the school is that by graduating learners with the ingenuity, purpose, capacity, and grit to mobilize collaborative innovation and cooperative action, we are doing the most valuable thing we can to contribute uh, to society. We envision Hampshire alumni continuing to change lives, communities, and the world for the better. So this is a highly idealistic place mm. that takes very seriously engagement in the world and engagement in the community. Um, students uh, are independent learners. The, the whole curriculum is built around their being able to choose their path, their inquiry, the questions that drive them. Uh, there are relatively few requirements, but one of them is that they complete two community-engaged learning uh, exercises, one focused internally on our community, one focused externally on the surrounding uh, community and world, and on both of those, they're required to reflect on the experience. It's part of their, uh, part of their academic responsibility to reflect on and build from that experience. Um, the third president of Hampshire College, Greg Prince, who was the longest serving president and was deeply committed to this aspect of the mission, wrote a book about halfway through his tenure titled, Teach Them to Question Authority. Um, I'm, I'm not sure we really have to <laughs> teach that. No, no, no. <laughs> It, it seems like the students who want to come to Hampshire may come with certain skills and attitudes in those lines anyway. Um, but, y you know, that's who we are. It, it can be messy. It can be contentious. It's often risky. Um, sometimes very, very hard uh, because... Uh, remembering the separation between what's happening institutionally and one's personal responsibility for it, as Professor Tinson keeps reminding me, is important but difficult. I came to Hampshire totally by accident. Um, 
I, I am an, a lawyer. Uh, I had spent uh, almost all of my career uh, as an advocate on sustainability and, and environmental uh, issues. Um, uh, after a brief stint as a federal prosecutor, I shifted over to suing the government and found that was a lot more fun. Um, <laughs> and often, uh, like shooting Budweiser trucks, I mean, anyway. Um, <laughs> A dear friend of mine had been the president of Hampshire, and in uh, 2011, she contacted me and persuaded me to meet with the Hampshire Search Committee, something that had never crossed my mind. Um, it, Hampshire Search Committee, being a Hampshire Search Committee, had 26 people on it. Um, we're inclusive. And six of them were students. And, um, the students were actually pretty ticked off. Uh, they hadn't much liked the previous president, and they wanted to assert their role in this process. And in the interview, they stationed themselves around the room. They planned their questions and their follow-ups, uh, and they tried to organize it so that it was their interview, uh, not the search committees. And there was one student on either side of me as I sat down. And and they absolutely barraged me. They argued with everything I said. Um, th they had these really probing questions. They looked into my background and questioned a lot of things that I'd done. About 45 minutes into this, I thought to myself, I have been working on issues I'm passionate about, sustainability issues, for 30-some years now. Uh, and I've had a fabulously successful career, and everything that I'm working on is getting worse at an accelerating rate. And if anybody's going to change it, it's going to be students like these. I probably should help them if I can. Uh, and here I am at Hampshire. Um, the point, and I'm sure this is why most of us are in the jobs we're in, is because it seems like such a fabulous opportunity to offer something to these students uh, to enable them, uh, as they move into the world, to have the greatest impact uh, possible. Um, so uh, when, when I encounter these challenges, I try to remind myself, yeah, but they're why I'm here. This, this is what it's all about. Chris, maybe you could start out um, talking uh, about your background uh, and the activism that you brought with you and, and how it moves you um, in today's situation with very different activist students. Sure, sure. Uh, first of all, I'm so happy to be home. Uh, California is my home, and I'm a proud graduate of San Francisco State University. <laughs> right on. The, uh, I was nurtured in the ethnic studies department um, there, and where I did my master's degree. Um, so, Considering my ethnic studies background um, and considering that I come from a besieged community of Los Angeles, Watts to be exact, activism is not a luxury. You know, it's, it's not something that I do uh, for academic credentials. And if I was not a teacher, not a professor, I probably would still be doing uh, more activism and, and, and we know well and good what kind of climate that we have to operate in right now, so there, there's a lot of activism to be done. Um, and so I never saw, you know, in ethnic studies, you know, we have an adversarial relationship to the academy to begin with. Um, there's a way in which ethnic studies is born out of a struggle for not only inclusion, but ideas about democratization and indeed uh, an idea that we're probably scared of in the liberal academy, which is the idea of a radical educational perspective. And so in ethnic studies, we, we uh, embrace that. We embrace that challenge. We embrace getting to the core of uh, society's problems. And um, we bring that into our academic training. So the two aren't mutually exclusive in our, in our understanding of, of how we do it, which also means that we're also not just there to teach students how to be activists. We actually are there to build scholars and to build uh, people who are 
um, producers of knowledge in the same way that people who are outside of ethnic studies do. So there, there isn't this, uh, it's a tension, but it's one that we learn to, to, to carry with us into uh, a wide variety of success um, in terms of if we're looking at just the number of academic departments that um, are Africana studies or black studies or have ethnic studies, and we're seeing more and more in the last few years, ethnic studies actually rolling out into the K through 12 educational system, which has always been part of the core mission of ethnic studies. Uh, so for me, going through the academy just brought, uh, just gave me an opportunity really to do what I would ordinarily be doing, um, except just on this stage of the academy. Um, and so I carried that with me. I also had some incredible mentors. Uh, I never imagined that I would be in this position necessarily, uh, but I had some incredible mentors, and I'll just name two. One is Dr. William Little, who passed away. He was at Cal State University, Dominguez Hills. And the other one um, is a professor who's moved on to another university, but who I met at uh, San Francisco State, and that is um, Nancy Mirabai. And um, Nancy was incredibly important. Um, to, to many folks, and I call her and, and many others just lifesavers, giving us opportunity to see ourselves in them and see ourselves at home in the academy. So when we were there, we never felt that we were totally out of place, although many of us indeed were. Um, and so for me, activism just becomes part of uh, this, this larger idea of producing scholarship and, making, and trying to make a difference, but also to hold yourself accountable to different kinds of um, desires, social desires for structural changes um, in society. So it's not that I'm teaching students how to be activists because many of them um, have to learn on their own what works and what doesn't work. But we're there to support them in their search for answers to some pressing questions around race and justice and equity, um, and structural inequality, and uh, you know, and to look deeply and historically about some of the things that they're, that they're dealing with. So for me, those things aren't so, you know, there's not a huge gulf between them. Uh, but I also just try to embrace um, where students are coming from and the things that they think are important. And I try to provide some support for that. But that all comes from my training in ethnic studies and the training that I got. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to put that out there um, to begin with. So I'm thinking, you know, maybe we could think about what is that relationship, self, institution, difference between personal accountability and institutional accountability and how those things overlap for you. I, I take a moment to think about this question. When, when Chris uh, sent me an email saying that this was one of the questions he was think, thinking about, uh, I found it really challenging. Um, particularly for those in, in my role, because I feel as if uh, this is the place where those two kinds of accountability come together. Um, as an individual uh, who is trying to provide leadership and uh, to embody values, to be able to articulate for the community a, a vision, it's compellingly important that I be able to identify the baggage that I carry uh, and understand um, the uh, blind spots that I work with because of the way I uh, grew up. And I'm solely responsible for that, but at the same time I need to be, be publicly responsible for that to be effective articulating these values and questions to our community. But I'm also the chief executive of an institution. Um, and the institution also carries baggage um, in the way it's defined its policies, in whom it is hired, in the culture that it's established, in the curriculum that it's developed. All of that reflects all of the racism that has been in our society since our school was created. Um, and the institution needs to be accountable for that, and I need to help the institution do that while recognizing that it, the institution is also accountable for a number of other values mm -hmm. and to multiple constituencies. And I, I find that interaction, interaction very complex, 
and I sense that it is often the case when I'm talking with the community that they don't necessarily perceive whether I'm speaking as the individual who is solely responsible for his own heart and understanding or the representative of the institution uh, which operates under multiple restrictions. Uh, and they just, the, the, the community just wants to push for those larger changes and have me mm -hmm. articulate and agree to them or as our title is, lean into it and, and figure out what we can do. It's a good question. Mm -hmm. So back at you, um, it, it won't surprise you that many of the most active students on campus end up in Professor Tinson's courses. Um, and he is wonderful at helping them find an intellectual framework for the questions that they're raising. But he is also uh, a partial mentor when they're thinking about how they want to challenge the institution within which he works. But they don't necessarily listen to you. And I, I wonder if you Not could talk about that relationship. Yeah. No, I, I mean, I would love to take credit for a lot of the activism that they do. Um, um, some, you know, some, some techniques and tactics I, I have used and, and uh, might use in the future, but then some, I'm like, I wouldn't do that, you know, if, uh, if given the chance. But one of the things I had to learn in this new environment is, is um, you know, students, they, they know what they want, uh, and they're not always wrong about what they want. I think the demand is just that it's a one-directional demand, right? And so one of the things I try to get them to understand is you have to be, even as an activist or even as the person with the good ideas, you have to be inclusive. In fact, you have to show whoever you're fighting against the vision that you're trying to create in the meantime. And so you can't replicate the structures of oppression, of silencing, you know, while you're saying we need to create some kind of broader vision. Um, so for me, I mean, one of the things that I think I've, I've, I've earned the respect of students because they know where my interests lie, they know where my commitments are, and it's not because I told them, it's because I showed them through my walk, right? So part of it is a, is a lifestyle more than a vocation. Um, so they, they know uh, where I'm standing on issues, um, and they want the, the institution typically to be accountable, you know, to those issues. And, um, but one of the things that I have to remind all the time is, is that we, we have a, um, a space, Hampshire College, that holds a great amount of difference. Uh, people coming from a lot of different uh, backgrounds. Some of the folks uh, haven't heard of issues around structural racism or institutional oppression until they got to our classrooms, right? And so, but once they learn what these things mean, then they're fired up about it. So the students have to also put forth a vision, but then also bring along people who aren't necessarily already baptized, if you will. So it's tough. Um, what I tell my students is that I definitely am going to have your back 100% in public. <laughs> Behind closed doors, we're going to have some disagreements, right? So how do, how do um, we hold that, you know, that, listen, I'm not going to, I don't want you to do things that um, are going to jeopardize your well-being. Um, but at the same time, if I see something that I think uh, we could do differently, I'm definitely going to tell you that. Now, after we've gone through that, it's your decision. And that has worked. Because that give and take, uh, you know, it's a, different, it's a different stage of mentoring. Listen, professors aren't the models, <laughs> if you will, that, uh, you know, I, I used to look up to my professors. I never wanted to, especially the ones in ethnic studies. I, I never wanted to disappoint them. I never wanted to show them that I wasn't capable of producing high-level work, beating them to the library, those kinds of things. But that kind of stuff is off the table for our students. And sometimes I, um, you know, the last few years I've really struggled, and part of it is because of the climate that we're talking about this weekend, is just students don't see graduate school um, 
as, as the go-to option that, that, that my generation, if you will, somehow I just became the old dude in the room, you know what I'm saying, <laughs> with my students. I'm like, how did this happen? I used to be the front line dude, and now I'm like holding my kid at the meeting, you know what I'm saying? I'm tripping. I still bug out on that. But I just, you know, it's one of those things where I'm like, okay, so the mentoring is different now, right? Like, they don't, they don't see me, they don't see my vocation necessarily for them. And what's behind that is that, and, and a couple of students actually just came to my office, you know, a couple of years ago in the heat of all of our struggles and just asked me, you know, Tencent, how do you do this? What they're really saying is, you know, how do you exist as a black studies professor in this PWI institution? That's really what they're trying to say, right? With all your colleagues, you know, <laughs> and, so, and all their habits. Um, <laughs> so You have a tape of that conversation? <laughs> <laughs> so they're like, how do you do this? And I'm thinking, what do you, what do you mean? How do, how do I do what? You know, I, I just feel like I'm just doing what I'm supposed to do, right? And so part of it is really trying to understand, like, what is a healthy work environment for them? Like, and so for them, if they see us fighting at every end, uh, it, the institution doesn't look like it's a desirable place to go and work and pursue, you know, seven to ten years of advanced study just to be in these spaces where you're going to have to mentor students around the same questions that you were struggling around as a student. <laughs> right? Because this issue that we're dealing with this week is not a new issue. That we all discovered that. So um, the point is, 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 is being honest, holding them to a standard of excellence, both as activists and as scholars. We have a dual responsibility, even people who are activists, uh, to also produce good scholarship. And I think that um, the proof is in the pudding. A lot of the, a lot of the new research and a lot of the uh, cutting edge and award-winning books are coming out of Africana studies, African-American history, um, you know, uh, those, those fields. So the idea that you can just be an activist and not produce good scholarship, I think that's, that's gone away. But our students just are in a place where they're making a decision about whether or not this is a de desirable space to be. Um, there's not many spaces, you know, for uh, smart people, you know what I'm saying, with PhDs in, under capitalism, you know what I'm saying? So how do you really how do you say that this is a, a lucrative track for them? And lucrative not just financially, but just this idea of health and well-being. I think sometimes our, our institutions become spaces of, of toxicity, and I think the students, um, they realize that when they see us suffering through things, and then, they, and then we're, we're surprised when they don't want to do what we're doing. Yeah. Um, and so, so for me, it's about just honoring where they're at. My commitments allow me to speak with them honestly about what we're dealing with, and then support them through the decisions that they make. To, let me ask you a follow-up question to get, get a little out of order here. Um, you've taken on a very significant leadership role in what's happening on campus now and in, in helping our campus address these questions and, f and find the skills to have a genuine conversation. Um, and Part of that has been your willingness to sacrifice family time and research time to do that. So first part of the question is why? Yeah. Second part of the question, um, as, as we are on this stage, you and I are, are caught in the dyad here and trying to develop enough trust so that I can let you do what you're doing and completely support it because I believe it's in the interest of the school and you can trust that I will. Uh, and that doesn't automatically happen on a campus. It, 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 there aren't vehicles for us yeah. to automatically develop that. And I, I'd appreciate your reflecting on it and then I'll talk a little bit about sure, it. Sure, sure, sure. No, I mean, uh, one, you asked me, right? So. Uh, <laughs> you know, it was like, I was like, yo, I'm over here, though. No. Just coming off sabbatical, you know what I'm saying? Like, I still have my shorts on, it's all good, you know? So, <laughs> listen, I, you asked, and I, you know, and it, it, the big thing is I really love my students, particularly the ones who you were struggling with. <laughs> um, you know, I really, I really love them, you know? They know, they know that I love them. Uh, they know that, um, 
that I have their back. Um, you know, and having their back comes in a lot of different forms, right? Uh, so part of it is that, and then and part of it is, is I believe, in uh, institutional transformation. I, be, I believe that, um, you know, if, we, if we're honest with ourselves, we know we haven't gotten it right all the time, right? Um, in our most honest sense, we got to just sit with that question. Have I gotten it right? Our students realize everything is not right. But yet, again, to, as was said at the earlier plenary, this idea of, you know, what do we say in our marketing packet, right, that everything's going to be cool. And the students come and realize that it's not so much of that, and then maybe they see us as people who are complicit in that. And then, you know, and so for them, then they're trying to figure out, okay, how do we ride on it, you know? How do we, how do we roll on that? So for me, it's, um, it's, it's trying to make sure that the questions they're raising <laughs> To, to the, the ability that I have, remain relevant to the direction of the college. So part of you know, what I'm trying to do is just make sure that we take them seriously. We take these demands seriously, that we uh, treat them with scrutiny, but, th but that we act in as if they are helping us get somewhere, and that we really honor their voices. So part of it is a, is a is a, is a way of trying to maintain that relationship. And, to, and you know, but, but at the same time, one part of your question I was thinking about was just this idea of, you know, I had to think about, you know, my reputation, you know, amongst these very students. That here they are struggling against the president or struggling against the trustees, and then, you know, one of the professors who's their ally decides, okay, we're gonna try to do some bridge building. That could be seen as, um, you know, contrary to their vision. You know, if you split the campus and just say, hey, you know, this us against them kind of, kind of space. So for, for me, I took a risk, and the way I was able to take the risk was just because they know where I've been, you know, in the last 10 years, teaching in Hampshire, when the major struggles come up, I'm usually the only professor that's willing to put his name on the line. Um, and before you and I were working closely together, at one, one rally, one campus takeover, I don't know if you remember, but you asked me, what should I do? And I said, listen, whether they ask you to be there or not, you need to show up. And they know that they're struggling against you, and you know that they're struggling against you for sure, but it's important for you, as, or as presidents, or as people in leadership, to show up. You know, sometimes just showing up makes the difference. Um, and so when they, you know, when they, when, they, when they call on me, they know where, I, where I'm going to stand, they know I'm going to have their back. And so, but at the same time, I took a risk. So I was, just, I was just basing it off my reputation with them to say, listen, you know what I'm struggling around. You know which issues I'm about. You know the things that I'm teaching. Um, you know, and again, you know, I mean, the perception of Hampshire is that we're just kind of producing, you know, Marxist intellectuals. <laughs> That was in our old pamphlet, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> the old one, circa 85, you know what I'm saying? Anyway. <laughs> no, we, you know, it's, a, it's an academic and it's an intellectual community. And listen, you know, our classroom will have people who barely graduated high school, who had to get pushed out of high school. In that same classroom, my, my history of the civil rights movement, black power era class, We'll have that student and then the student who could have went to MIT but chose Hampshire. Out of 25 students, that's the range that I would have. What's my goal is to keep both of them at the table. There are different levels of learning, different level of exposure, different level of commitment, but I have to keep both of them there around the subject. And thankfully, you know, I've been able to do that effectively, but it's through that you know, it's through that trial and error, that reputation, and, and just trying to build and, and keep a door open with the students. Um, sometimes I would love to get to my essays and stuff, but you know, like, I keep, keep my door open for meetings. But um, I, I based it on that reputation, and I took a rest, risk to say, like, look, we're going to try to build. And it's an ongoing thing. I don't want you to think we solved all the problems or anything, but it's just an ongoing thing, and we're just trying to make sure people stay in, in conversation as much yep. as possible around these questions. But let me ask you something, man. Yep. 
asking me all the questions. Mm -hmm. Why are you always asking all I'm, these questions? I'm a lawyer. I get these skills. <laughs> <laughs> I had to give an E40 a little love. All right, so a um, couple people got that. So, <laughs> so our, the theme is leading into our deepest yes. And so the question is, you know, how, how much, how, how accountable can we be, right? These institutions, which, as you said, have, has their values, has their principles set, uh, their pillars, you know, of knowledge and why they exist and what the alums and donors and trustees expect. How accountable can our liberal arts institutions be um, to, to a sense and a vision of racial justice yeah. in particular? And how do you, you know, how do you read what's, what's happening right now? So I, I, I do think that's our theme for the day in, in, in a nutshell. It's how accountable can we be and how can we be accountable? What, what kind of mechanisms can we create that work for these institutions sure. that have a, a broad societal purpose. And I, I think the first answer goes back to what you said about why you agreed to get involved in campus leadership on this, because you love your students. And that, that's what I heard again and again this morning. It, it's why we're all here. And if we start from that point, that our, we're there to help them grow, evolve, and learn, sure. and help them see that they need to challenge these institutions, then we can't not be accountable. Uh, so we need to find some way to have the conversation that, that creates an accountability that doesn't become just an artificial mechanism sure. for students hammering on administrators and administrators hunkering down saying, I can't do that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and my hope is that that becomes more possible as we build more genuine community. Um, so if we learn to talk to each other and that it is profitable in terms of our objectives to be able to talk to each other, and if we identify a set of genuinely shared values that hold, we're all there voluntarily. Yeah. Nobody forced us to come to the, this school. We're, we're there because we want to be. So that, if that's the basis for establishing genuine community, then we can afford to make ourselves accountable to one another. Uh, mm -hmm. And <clears throat> the end of last semester, you may have seen that we had a tough semester and had a little disagreement with some people off campus about the American flag, um, <clears throat> which I'm happy to talk about if anybody wants to hear more about it. Um, but we were looking for ways to do some healing on campus. Mm -hmm. um, and one uh, uh, wonderful theater professor uh, came up with a proposal uh, to uh, enable faculty to do small acts of community. So we created this micro-grants program. And literally scores of faculty members at the end of the semester invented things with their students that they were going to do that were about community. It might just be sitting down over a meal and talking about the semester or talking about some sort of appreciative inquiry, or it might be something genuinely designed to give back to the community. Mm -hmm. But it, it was amazing when this was announced. It was, it was December. Everybody was thinking about going home. and. We ended up getting like 45 proposals for people who wanted to find ways to build community. That that said something to me about mm -hmm. the inclination we can build on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you know, one of the things we found out too, and just talking to people across campus, is, you know, people at our schools they really need each other. I mean, I know that sounds a little Hallmark card status, you know what I'm saying? And I understand, but it, we really do need each other in a, in a real sense. And, and if, 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 you know, if we can produce spaces where people can, um, can just have a conversation, one hour lunch break about what's coming up for them, whether it's campus issues or social issues, we found that that was very generative. And it was a, it was a space in which um, people wanted to grow in. 
and conversation, you know, the, the space to create conversation, the space to think and reflect on things that are going on on campus, um, we need more of that. Yeah. I think par partially, too, we need more staff involvement in the intellectual work that we're doing. Um, and I'm not talking about co-writing papers and stuff like that, but just, you know, when things come up on the intellectual side or the academic side, you know, how are we including the people who run our offices, who the, the universities and colleges would close without? Um, so how, you know, how are they brought, or do we give them space to actually come and engage in uh, the campus lecture? Or do, are they invited, or are they j just invited to work? And these are the kinds of things that, that um, create kind of invisible gulfs, you know, and gaps in our, in our, in our campus communities. Because one of the things we found is uh, when we held our meeting, you know, there were people that I had never seen on campus before. Um, they have been there 25 years, 30 years working in, you know, the financial aid office and this office raising money and making the life of the campus work. Um, never been invited to these conversations. So it was just a good space for us to kind of reach out and see who would come, and the room was packed, and, um, and we had some good conversation out of that. But one of the things that we're trying to get people to understand, too, is that um, our, our treasured concept, or one of the things we discovered, our treasured, treasured concept of free speech, which we all, you know, look to whenever people feel like they're not being heard or something, and, I, and we discovered that it was, it was a good starting point, but f just the notion of, or just the articulation of free, free speech wasn't enough to do the kind of work that we needed to do to bring people together. So we started talking about how do we create democratic speech environments on our campus, right? And the democratic speech environment is one that's not just about uh, one's individual right to speak. It's about saying, yes, your voice matters, but that you are accountable to other voices that also matter. And creating that kind of space and that kind of energy and also just giving people a new vocabulary, uh, for our campus, it helped to move the needle a little bit, right? Because we start saying, hey, you're a part of this process too. Who's not at the table? Who's at the table? But more importantly, what histories are we bringing to the table? Right? What, history, what campus histories are we bringing to the table? What social histories are we bringing to the table? And then how in that information space, that knowledge space, can we now have a conversation about what needs to happen? And so we're just at the beginning stages of that. But we're this semester going to be rolling out more of those kinds of, um, you know, kind of discursive mechanisms to really help us shift our climate just at the conversational level. Because we can't, make, we can't all make demands separately, right? Um, and we're going to have to agree on some things that we all want to push for collectively. And the conversation to see what's, what's pushing people's buttons is one place to, to really understand that. Um, how many, are we good on time? Yeah. yeah. Go to questions? Sure. So this was the best part of this morning. Your questions were so good, so we're counting on you. Got one right there. Yep. Or shed the mic. I'm sorry. Good afternoon. Yes. Um, I am curious about, um, actually, I'm distressed about the number of my student activist leaders who ended up also on my probation and suspension list. Yeah, 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 yeah. And how do we help them find balance? Um, you know, I'm tasked with diversifying our professoriate, but my professoriate is in front of Palmer Hall and not in the classroom. Yep. <laughs> yep, exactly. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's tough. I mean, we, we, you know, one of the things that, that I was discovering with my students is um, it goes back to something I was saying earlier about trying to, who do we honor on campus? We, you know, for the students, we have to figure out, I mean, the students have to figure out who do, who do they honor on campus besides themselves. Because we know, you know, um, we know they, they have a high, you know, self-value, right, um, <laughs> to themselves. Um, because I think part of that is just thinking about, you know, when I was in school in the 90s, we, you know, we did, we did a lot of campus shutdown. We did a lot of, uh, you know, education around political prisoners, for example. Um, and 
you know, we, but we also made sure we got our papers done. I know that sounds crazy, and it still is not a selling point to students, so I'm not, I'm not surprised that you're looking at me like, man, I tried that, I'm good. But there's a way in which they have to know that that's their expectation all the time. You know, you can't have your activism be the sole reason that you're on campus. I tell my students, and again, it comes down to trust and, you know, who can say what sometimes. Sometimes, um, if you are ready to start the revolution, you do not need Hampshire College to do that. You can go do it. And if your ideas are attractive enough, I'll be out there with you. So you don't need my class. Like, it's, it's all good. If you're ready to just shut me down and say, oh, you know, you don't know anything, <laughs> this school is irrelevant. If you're ready to do social transformation, you can go do that. It's okay. But you're here for a reason. And so for me, I discovered that, um, and we were talking about this during the pregame, it's just, you know, I'm a sports guy, sorry. <laughs> during the pregame, we were talking about this, um, I'm struck by the fact that even though my students oftentimes express that they detest Hampshire College. They express that. There's a little bit of germ of love in there. And they come back the following semester after, after we had the storm. So I'm like, why you come back? You know, I'm thinking to myself, there must be something that they get out of it, right? So our, our job then is to keep them understanding the wide variety of reasons why they're there, not just focus on one reason because home's terrible, or because I'm trying to do this, or trying to get a job. Not just focus on one reason, but the multitude of reasons why you are finding yourself at Hampshire College. I tell my students all the time, we did not meet in the park, we did not meet at the bookstore, you know what I'm saying, we did not meet, you know, at the rally. We just met in a classroom. And in a classroom, we do things like exchange ideas, like debate over ideas, like substantiate our points, like appreciate an archive. Those kinds of things I want them to appreciate as much as the activism part. Um, but it's tough because we have this, uh, this, this kind of new language that's out there around labor amongst our students and that they have uh, started to interpret campus activism as a form of labor. That's a discourse we did not have in the 1990s. Okay? You did it because you wanted your issue heard. You didn't do it because you were trying to finagle it into a job from the university. <laughs> and this is not to turn my students into opportunists. It's just to say, this is part of the climate, the environment, the linguistic environment that they are a part of. Um, and so how do we adapt ourselves to that without saying, oh, back in the day, we used to walk through snow and all this kind of stuff. <laughs> you know, but, but they are at a school. And we've got to do the things that schools do at the end of the day. And then, and, and then when they graduate, listen, I'm, first, I'm the first one cheerleading. You know what I'm saying? So it's an it's a ongoing kind of thing. But I think this, this question of how we honor their activism, um, how we show that they are uh, co-creators of knowledge in the campus climate that's healthy and vibrant is, is really important. Um, and that's something that, that changes with every cohort. But I think that, you know, if we just maintain what we know we're doing well, but honest about the things that we're not doing well, I think that could build trust and that esteem so that they, that'll carry them through. Because that term resilience is not one to shrug off. It's, it is one um, that is important, and we use it in the term of our committee, speaking across uh, resilient communities, SPARC. That term resilience is really important because of this, this term grit, but beyond that, I hang out with a lot of artists, and one of uh, one of the artists I really appreciate, and you've probably seen his work from Minneapolis, his name is uh, Ricardo Levis Morales, and he says that resilience is not an individual skill or trait, but a community's capacity to come together in the face of oppression. That's a different concept of resilience than just hang in there, right? Just hang in there till graduation. It's a different commitment that's in that. Right? It's a different kind of lean, if you will. And so for me, I try to introduce students to that. And then the other piece is, you know, when all else fails, go to Bell Hooks. <laughs> you know, Bell been saving a lot of folks for a long time. <laughs> okay? 
bell hooks, you know, and, and in her book, Teaching Community, you know, Teaching Community, she says, our role as educators is not to train students to be dominators or not education for domination, but to be a part of a knowledge community that is always subject to challenge and change. That's what we're about. If we're not about that, let's close the doors on our schools. And if we can't stand on that, giving Bell, Cook, Bell credit, you know what I'm saying? If we can't stand on that, then, yeah, why do we need these jobs? Right? Why, why, why are we up here right now? And so what are we holding ourselves to? You know, what kind of standards do we hold ourselves to? What kind of resilience, what kind of scars can be revealed about being in these spaces that I think um, we need to be honest about and our, it would, I think, bring our students to the table a little bit more. Um, so that's the way I'll answer that. Thank you. Another question? Yeah. Um, thank you very much, uh, President Lush and uh, Professor Tinson. Uh, I think Hampshire College shows us uh, some of what can be the best available arts education in this country. I want to uh, follow up on this question of labor, uh, particularly having to do with the faculty, sure. reward and recognition systems. Uh, so, in what ways can these reward and recognition systems be crafted such that the work that you're doing, that President Lush acknowledged, takes you away from your family, from your research, from your teaching, can be recognized? Mm -hmm. Many young faculty uh, come up to me and they say, Kazi, we want to uh, do all this, and I look at them straight in the eye. Right. And I say, you serve us best if you can have the protections of this institution. Right. I'd rather you do that than we lose you. Right. So your comments to both of you. Yeah. You want to start? No. Um, so, so there's a, a simple, not very satisfactory answer, uh, particularly with respect to faculty, that all faculty are... Uh, expected to participate in the governance and maintenance of the community, that, that doesn't describe the extent of the commitment that Professor Tinson is making at all. Um, so for me, it's a reflection of the passion. We all have this sense that, that our community faced a, a genuine crisis, um, and uh, there were a few members of the faculty who... That I, I was out all last spring, I was sick, and so I was trying to find out what, what the hell went on. Um, and um, there were a few members of the faculty who, after describing the depth of the crisis and how painful it was, talked about what an opportunity it was yeah. um, for us to actually confront these issues. Now it's out on the table. Now, now it hurt. Now, now we really knew it was present, and there was no way to just sort of move on. Now's the time to... and, and I, I, I think in the end, the reward is the opportunity to do that. I, I, I wish I could offer more, uh, but we're in mission-driven organizations. We're part of the community, and there's a deep satisfaction in, in building it. Well, you know, hey, we live in under Western capitalism. <laughs> so, you know, like, I charge by the syllable. <laughs> I'm just joking. <laughs> Listen, you know, it's, it, it's, it's, a tough, it's a tough thing. And it's one of the things that, you know, my colleagues and I, we don't, um, we don't all come down to the agreement on, on just what to do. And so it does come down to individual passions. But, um, you know, what we want to do, we're unique at Hampshire in one regard in terms of the faculty side is that we were eligible for our sabbatical um, after three years, right? So that's, you know, most, in most institutions after seven, right? Six or seven is like the cutoff. We get ours halfway, right? Part of that is to, to, to honor the amount of advising that we do, because um, we do a ton of advising. Um, but, I, but I think, listen, I mean, we need to look to the Europeans, um, because they got this right, which is that, and I said the Europeans, like, it's just, you know. Anyway, you get, hold up, hold on. <laughs> 
<laughs> is is um, the I had a I had a 18th century joke in there that I was gonna put in, but I'm good. <laughs> what did, what did, what I mean by that is that we need to give people more time off in general. All jobs need time off because I feel that like you would feel better about your work if you had a little time to rest and rejuvenate. Now we have this, you know, um, which is it's a remnant of, you know, of the factory culture, right? You know, that, that, that academic industrial complex doesn't sleep. And so in that sense, we do, the academy does grind us down. So we have to figure out ways to protect each other from that honor the people and the work that they're doing, but also give them space to get to their work, uh, which is to say their individual work, which is to say their, their books and their essays and their book reviews. Keep things percolating on the CV that's actually going to protect them at the institutional level. And then uh, on the other side, don't criticize them when they are developing things, right, that other faculty far more tenured have decided to move on from, right? So this becomes a kind of uh, competitive streak within our institution that's just built into the DNA of it because we have something called assistant professor, associate professor, and full professor. And that class structure within the academy, we all do that dance. And those of us in this room have all done that dance. And so I just want to make sure I'm, if I'm going to dance, Kendrick Lamar is playing. Okay, <laughs> so if I'm if I'm rocking that in this Kendrick on all day, okay. So for me, how do we, you know, how do we, and what I mean by that is, how do we allow the people with all the talent and the know-how and the skills and the risk-taking ability and the courage, how do we, how do we protect that, you know? So part of the reward to me is actually protecting that, honoring that people have some new ideas to offer, um, and not not putting up as many roadblocks, um, as much red tape as you can to, to, to allow those folks to do their work. Um, so, and then part of that is just their, their relationship with students as well. I mean, because some of it is because we're, we're the only one at our school, right, sometimes, or the only one in one department, a person of color, and then students of color just naturally saying, hey, I need to talk. That turns into a mentoring relationship. Now, as open as your door is, because your commitments, that does come down to work, right? And so it is time that you're not, you know, doing other things that you could do that could help you stay at the institution long term. So it's a, it's a difficult thing. It's one that um, I think we can address better once we know it fully, but also understanding that there's a lot of people who could be here that aren't because their dance wasn't good enough, right, and, or by somebody's standards. And so there's, there's that part that's in there that makes us you know, aggressive, you know, towards each other, keeps us away from doing deeper community involvement in some cases, in some institutions. Um, and then if there's a type of community involvement that doesn't align with the vision, mission, and values of the campus, then we don't want to give it credit, see? So we have to figure out what do we actually value, you know? Um, and, and how do we show that we value the many things that, that um, our contributors of knowledge across campus bring to our campuses. So I think it's me, because I have the microphone. I'll stand, though I'm not much taller standing. <laughs> and I think this will be the last question. Um, so thank you, and I wanted to pick up on that and also on the previous discussion of how you have to mentor students not to recreate systems of oppression while attempting to get out of systems of oppression. That's right. Um, and picking up on the street cred, too, I'll say that. So for me, for instance, as a preamble, I have a intersecting complicated identity. So for instance, just take one part. If you're both Spanish and Latin American, and you're the product <laughs> of a conflicting colonial moment, you're gonna have different experiences in life, right? Within your own house even. Um, and so I now, in my old age, find that a blessing. I found it hard 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, because students of all kinds come to me, right? And I feel that responsibility too. Because everyone perceives what they need to perceive from me. So what I have found myself having so often, recently in particular, are conversations in which I'm saying to students, I understand what that you're telling me that civil discourse doesn't make sense to you right now. I understand that what you're telling me is that somebody else's belief system eliminates your existence. 
somebody else's belief system is made out of hate and just gets rid of you, whether you're transgender, beyond the binary, whether it's ethnic, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And then I say, I also understand we have to talk. So how are we gonna get from those two points? And I right. thought, maybe you could share some thoughts on that. That one's definitely to you. That's for me. <laughs> no, I just, um, you know, I, I look at it from a teacher's perspective because um, one of the things that we are forced to do is just take people where they are. Um, you know, you don't always choose, you don't, you don't ever choose the students who are taking your classes. Um, and you, you certainly don't choose the people that sometimes that you're going to do good work with. Um, you, and so part of it is just staying open the, and, and, and committed to a, an idea that humanity um, has to, you know, work together somehow, right? Like this is idea. So we don't, you know, so I try to teach students not to, not to foreclose any kind of uh, connections. Um, and, or possible connections, you know, but part of that is just staying open, uh, being willing to be uncomfortable, um, admitting that some issues are going to require some reflection um, and, and deeper thinking. And then the last piece is just figuring out that, or realizing or admitting that it's not going to be resolved today, right? That there's a kind of long, trajectory or arc, if you will, that we want to commit them to because we're on that arc too. Um, I think that those are my strategies for trying to be open and I have a ton of difficult conversations and the last thing I would say is the, um, one of my students was saying, you know, sometimes we, we're back to this labor question, we're, we're tired of, you know, being here for, you know, this is student, this student who doesn't know this and I told her, that sometimes we can't say no, right? That, you know, I can't, you know, just shut my door. If I'm in my office and somebody comes and they want to talk in that moment, sometimes I can't say no. Not because I just want this conversation, but, but because, you know, I'm being asked. You know, I, I'm being needed in this moment. So I don't, so I try to get students to understand that, right? That sometimes they're going to be needed when they least expected it. And it may feel like labor, but really what you're doing is trying to be there for another human being. And that's it. Once we get to that kind of commitment, it feels to me that then we can put the ideological things or the vision on top of that just basic formula of saying, I honor the person that's in front of me, right, on some level. And I think that that would just open up some doors and conversation. And it's also a tool that they could then use back in their student spaces. Now, all this stuff takes a lot of time and commitment. And I'm not trying to just give you a one-off, but it's just this idea of saying, you know, planting the seed for openness and conversation can go a long way. So just one last comment. I, I hope you have seen the kind of interaction that takes place between us that I think is essential for us to be able to work together on the campus on these issues. I, I trust Professor Tinson to tell me when I'm full of crap. Um, and I, I trust him to be explicit about his commitment yeah. to the students. Um, and I think he knows that I'm willing to recognize that there are certain roles I just have to play as the president and it isn't going to be fun and it isn't going to be all about hugs and kisses, but it's still essential to create room on, on the right. campus. And, and I, you know, we're all going to be stuck in those kinds of dyads, right? We, we have to invent this as a starting point for the larger campus to be able to interact. That's right. I mean, I, I have my motto is, and I learned this through being at Hampshire, that the good work you won't always get credit for, but you got to do it regardless. Thank you so much. Let's thank both of our speakers. <laughs>